Now, after my last two videos, I realize I have two choices here. I can take the low road and be all, ha, 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 you didn't understand. Or I can take the high road and take advantage of this opportunity to, like, put some knowledge out into the world. But there's no punchline. Get your pencil. Since both of the Milos didn't understand archaeoastronomy, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that a lot of the people watching this video don't understand archaeoastronomy. And if you're going to engage in this whole conversation about Graham Hancock and about solar alignments and stellar alignments and all that crap, you really need to have at least a basic understanding of this stuff or you're just kind of like shooting in the dark with this as I demonstrated in my last couple of videos. So without further ado, here is your school lesson. Archaeoastronomy is a combined field. It is the fields of archaeology and astronomy, big shock, frequently informed by anthropology. And it's a study of how the ancients viewed the night sky, how they incorporated astronomical alignments and things into their lives. The things that most of you will be aware of is the building alignments. This is the public face of it. This is what's been gotten the most press over time. But there's other aspects of it too. Artifacts are a huge part of it. There's, you know, just a pin or a shoe or a hat or something small, a dish, can frequently show you how the ancients looked at their night sky, how they looked at the different constellations that they would have and things along those lines, which planets were important to them and all of this. So there's that part of the study. Mythology is also used in astroarchaeology, and this separates the two branches loosely speaking of old world and new world new world frequently does it without the benefit of myth so they rely on a more robust mathematical model and precision alignments um, in the new world they have a lot of myths to go on so they rely on less robust mathematical models they don't have, have to eliminate chance nearly as much as they do in the new world or in the old world excuse me because they realize that, hey, these guys looked at Venus, for example, in South America, so they can look for alignments to certain important dates with Venus. Now, rudimentary astroarchaeology has been practiced for a very long time, but in the 1930s, a British guy by the name of Alexander Tom really kind of pushed it forward with his hypothesis that there was a number of precise alignments dotting the English countryside. And he made a number of predictions that were largely ignored up until the 1960s and 70s. In the 1970s, a man by the name of Ewan Mackey, who is considered one of the founding fathers of astroarchaeology, an archaeologist himself, he said, you know what, if this guy Tom made some predictions, maybe I should go see if I can verify any of them. So he went to a place called Kertral, I believe it's pronounced, and there's a standing stone there. And Tom had predicted that there would be a platform up a few meters on the side of this hill in order to look out and make this astronomical alignment with the sun. Ewan Mackey found that platform, and that was highly publicized, and then there was a few other findings like that, and next thing you know, this went from being a fancy hobby for academics into an actual field of study, a multidisciplinary field of study, no less, which is where a lot of the confusion comes from. Okay, so you know that it's a real field of study, and you got a brief history of it. Now let's get into the reason we're all actually here. You want to know about how they make these alignments work. Now, latitude and longitude is how they map the Earth, obviously, and they use the equator as the zero point for latitude, and they use Greenwich, England, which is basically an arbitrary mark for the longitude. And those are the zero points, and from there, they map the Earth in degrees, right? Now, if you extend that network out into space, and you consider the night sky basically a bowl, and the inside of it's all painted with the stars, because that's how it kind of appears, you can imagine that same plot being placed over those stars a line extending out from the equator into that bowl and that is called declination and that would be zero degrees of declination and then right ascension is the equivalent of latitude the zero point for that being the vernal equinox <sighs> now with this system you can plot the position of any object in the night sky now when you look at the night sky from thousands of years ago one must take into account precession of the equinoxes the Earth doesn't just spin on its axis, it also wobbles a little bit like a top. And that wobble takes about 25,000 years for it to go all the way around. And during that time, the stars, the North Star and everything, will slightly change because the axis is pointing at different directions. It changes about 1 degree per 71.6 years. So this causes building alignments to go out over a long period of time. So if you look at a building that's, say, from 3500 BC, you need to 
then remake the sky from 3500 BC, which they do with computer models, obviously. But this is how they determine if there's an alignment or not. Now, it's worth pointing out really quickly, even though probably all of you know, that the stars seem to move as a fixed background in the night sky. The sun, moon, and planets all kind of do their own thing. And so this also must be taken into account when you are looking for planetary alignments. So to put it all together, an archaeoastronomer will go to a site and first they will look for the site's alignment. And usually these are pretty obvious. There will be some two or three things together that make it very obvious that it's pointed in a certain direction. It's meant to be viewed from here and viewed through there. That's why Alexander Tom was able to put so many of these things together in the 30s. After they've done that, they'll take a reading called an azimuth, and this will let them know where this points at the night sky. Then they will compare this to a bunch of different charts that they've got for data of the appropriate era. So like say the archaeology says the site's from 2,000 years ago, they'll look at that night sky from 2,000 years ago and they'll probably go a little bit further back, but they're not going to go crazy with it. It's archaeoastronomy, it's not Graham Hancock astronomy, right? So they, it's very much based on archaeology as well as the astronomy. As a matter of fact, that was a sticking point in the early days. Now, if there are multiple items at the site that they believe have astronomical alignments, they will take an azimuth for all of them. And if that's old world archaeology, that's really about as good as it's going to get for them. They'll use complicated mathematical models to eliminate chance as much as possible and determine which direction these landmarks faced. Most often it will be a solar or a lunar alignment, but frequently it is a stellar alignment. Now, if it's in the New World, they have a whole different ball of wax they can unravel. They can use, like the Mayan codexes that we still have, a pretty good amount of that they can look through and say, oh, this is important to these people. Oh, this isn't important to those people. For example, they just decoded the Mayan calendar, and it let us know that the Mayans used all of the planets that were visible with the naked eye in their calendar and incorporated it all together. So that would stand to reason that they did use alignments towards planets in their day and age. So that gives us something to look for, which in the old world would be much more difficult to do. You would have to find 20 buildings where in a new world it really only takes one and a codex. And then when they've gathered all of their data and they'll form a hypothesis either based on myth or based on the different directions that things seem to point at, they will use math to eliminate chance as much as possible and they will publish their findings. The findings will be published by astronomers and archaeologists and usually a mathematician or two will be in the mix. Quite frequently an anthropologist, it is a multidisciplinary field, which again is why it's so hard to understand for a lot of people who aren't into both. I mean, let's be honest, archaeology, while it's a lot more of a hard science than something like psychology, is far less data-driven and far more open to interpretation than something like astronomy. So an astronomer is very pff, compared to an archaeologist who can get a little artsy with it. Anyway, I hope this gives you the tools to understand what people are talking about when we're discussing these alignments in the night sky. And the next time somebody says, I don't think that could possibly be aligned to a star, or I'm not really sure about that, you'll at least have some rudimentary understanding of it. I'll put a few links in the description to about the best channel on archaeoastronomy I could find on YouTube, the Archaeoastronomy uh, Resource Center, I believe he's called. And he does a lot of readings, which is kind of boring to look at, but it's important to have that information out there because he publishes the azimuth and stuff on his website or on a, his YouTube. But more importantly, there's a few things here where like discusses the motions of the sun and the moon and things like that. I'll put those down there so that you can look into this further if you would like to. Um, it's basically, if you don't understand astronomy, this is going to be kind of hard for you to get. So... Anyway, thanks a lot for watching this far. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I really appreciate all the support I'm getting. It's just it's just great to see how many of you actually appreciate this kind of content. When I started making this, I did not think that I would have half as many people nearly this quick. So thank you so much. Keep sharing and doing what we're doing, and I will keep sending the videos to you as fast as I can. Have a good night. Due to precession of the Earth's axis, the time of year when a chosen star first appears won't match the solar year after a few hundred years. A horizon marker could be set up, and the movement of the sun on the horizon could be tracked relative to it. If the marker is not placed at one of the maximum solstice positions, it will be reached twice in the year, once going north and once going south. But if counted only when reaching the marker from one of those directions, a very good count of days could be obtained.